Hey, what's up everybody? It's Lids, and we're back for some more Gwent, and today we're playing the new Entrenched Seasonal Event, which is an alternate game mode in which every time we play a unit, that unit gets resilience. And if that sounds strong, it is. And today we're playing a deck with a bunch of the new cards that are exponentially stronger than usual. So let's go give it a look. So today we'll be playing a Nilfgaard Tactical Decision deck that is built around the new Cultists that were recently added, the primary component of the deck being the new scenario, the Eternal Eclipse, which means that whenever we play a Gold Cultist, we'll progress this scenario. And most importantly, when we trigger Chapter 1, all non-disloyal Cultists on the battlefield, in our hand and in our deck, whenever we play a Cultist, we'll get boosted by 1. And every time we do that, the value goes up by 1 if it's a Gold Cultist, or goes up by 2 if it's a Bronze Cultist, which means that over time, these boosts become absolutely huge and scale based on the number of total Cultists that we end up playing. And so that means that we naturally want to play as many cultists as possible. There are not that many starting cultists available to us as Nilfgaard. So we just have the Prophet. That's one. We have Master of Ceremonies. That's two. He will randomly give two gold cards in our starting deck the cultist status. So that means that that's two more. Just make sure that when the game starts, you check which units those happen to have been. And then, of course, we have the starting bronze cultist with... The Eternal Eclipse Deacon, which is actually a card you'd like to play ideally before you start using all of your scenario chapters, because that way you can create more cultists in your hand and in your deck. And because if you do that before you trigger chapter one of the scenario, that means in total, that's more cards that are receiving this extra infusion of getting boosted whenever you play a cultist. So ideal order of operations is Deacon first, if you're getting a little greedy, and then you play the Eternal Eclipse, or at least then you trigger Chapter 1 of the Eternal Eclipse by playing a Gold Cultist, because of course the Deacon is a Bronze. And then lastly, and actually perhaps most importantly, we have the Eternal Eclipse Initiate, which it's a Bronze Cultist, and we can infuse one of our opponent's cards with a status, which means that when that card gets destroyed, we will create a copy of it on our side of the board and turn it into a Cultist in the process, so it's capable of scoring a ton of points in particular because what usually happens in standard with this setup is that as the round goes on, the number of points you get from the boost whenever you play a cultist goes up. Because remember, it starts off as just one point boost when you play your first cultist, but then for the next one, it's two points, then it's three points, so on and so forth. Or if you're playing bronze cultist, then it goes up even faster than that. However, if your units that have those infusions stay on the board in between rounds because they have resilience, then suddenly that means you have even more time to power up this infused ability. And so your boosts do reset in between rounds. However, the infusion doesn't, then that means, sure, my cards may be set back to their base value, but if they get boosted by four or five with the first cultists that I play, and I have that status on multiple of my units, then I'm getting maybe 20 plus points after playing just one card in the beginning of the next round. So that's why this is so effective in a seasonal event in which you have that resilience. So that is the key. Other than that, we have cards like Etibald, which can help us deal more damage, and it's another infusion. And the other nifty thing about infusing your opponent's cards with bad statuses for them is that normally you'd say, okay, well, I'll purify that status, and then they won't have to deal with that anymore. Problem is, if they do that, then they're losing their resilience, and so it comes at a really steep cost if they do want to go that route. And so that certainly helps us as well. We also have a couple of thirsty teams because when all of our opponent's units automatically get that resilience, then that's an easy way to give her points. And we're infusing a bunch of cards. That means more statuses from that as well. So just tons of ways to turn a thirsty dame into a powerful boosting engine, including with Emir, who, because he's going to give stat uh, spying to all of our opponent's units once we play him, is another way to power up the thirsty dames. And then we also have the Doadric, plus Snowdrop combo, which is fantastic for a couple of reasons. One, because you draw cards with Snowdrop, and you draw cards with Doedric, and put other cards back into your deck. Basically, it's a way of fine-tuning your hand, getting the cards you really want to have. So that way, if you have specific cultists you want to play, and other cards that did not get the cultist tag, then you can put those back into your deck. So that synergizes better with your scenario. And because every time you draw a card, that of course will boost Snowdrop, and she'll do two-card draw, from her ability, but Dodra can do one card draw every single turn, so collectively, they make Snowdrop a very dangerous engine, and if you can do that for multiple rounds, because you have the resilience on both of them, then that continues to make Snowdrop a dangerous card, and she actually gets boosted 
If she has resilience, she gets boosted when you draw cards in between rounds, which is really cool. So that is the one exception to getting all your boosts reset in between rounds. Snowdrop will at least start off with uh, six points of boost from that. And even from our leader really as well, we can get her boosted from that too. So for all those reasons, that's a nifty way to get another set of engines on the board. And then finally, we have a little bit more in the way of purification with things like Moon Dust. Basically, uh, if you can't infuse one of your opponent's cards with a bunch of negative statuses and it's dangerous, then, you know, maybe it's a gold. So you can't use the uh, initiate infusion on it, then use this to purify it. So that way it's not carrying over into the next round. You get rid of the resilience. And similar story in the case of our Pellers. And then we have a little bit of additional damage with things like the Imperial Enforcers, and this obviously synergizes well with Emir because it gets additional charges to deal additional damage whenever our opponents gain spying, and Emir gives us tons of spying. And we also have the Maganel, which also deals damage based on our opponents receiving the spying status. So the idea here being that if you're really trying to go after whatever cards that you infuse with the Eternal Eclipse Initiate, there's just more ways to actually get the Death Blow to trigger on that card, or Death Wish technically to trigger on that card. And if, for whatever reason, you don't have enough damage to destroy one of those cards that has the Infusion, or just has Resilience, then you can use Vincent to immediately destroy it. So this is your nice... So this is basically your automatic removal card. With all that, that means we have tons of statuses, tons of ways to give a, a boost to ourselves from those statuses and deal damage from those statuses or purify our opponent's cards so they don't have the resilience, so they can't carry things over from one round to the next. And when we have a super powerful infusion we're putting on all of our cards, then even this scenario here, the Eternal Eclipse will get resilience as well. So if you are getting a little bit greedy and trying to set it up, preemptively by using the deacons before you actually play the scenario. Normally the risk to that would be, okay, if you're playing a scenario mid-round, your opponent might just immediately pass and then you miss out on benefiting much at all from your scenario. However, because in this case, in this event, it will still stay on the board, you can then still play it mid-round after setting it up with the deacons and just in the next round, that's when you actually trigger the chapter one. In that case, totally fine. So there's a look at the deck, and overall, I think this is going to be a really effective way to approach this event, because usually purification is one of the go-to strategies, since it can get rid of one of the strongest things that people have, all the resilience. We have some of that, but we also have ways to destroy our opponent's cards, and that's another way of not only getting rid of the resilience, but also reducing their point total as well, and certainly boosting ourselves up in the process. So let's go see it in action. Alright, so going up against Nilfgaard here, and they'll go first. Okay, and so we have no scenario, but we do have Oniro, which we can use, of course, to get our scenario. We have several cultists in hand of both the bronze and gold variety. Remember, we need gold specifically to trigger our scenario, but we actually might like to preemptively set up more cultists using the deacon. So, okay, we have Etobald was one of the two gold cards to become a cultist at the beginning of the match. Vincent apparently was the other. So, what if we swap out maybe Vanganel? Thirsty Dame certainly will get some big boosts and perhaps Dumpy as well. Okay, we'll get another Vanganel in that case. If we had. Oh! Well, this will be interesting. Bit of a mirror match, it seems. Now, of course, they're double cross and we're tactical decision, but still. And. Okay. I was going to say, if we had. Uh... Emir, then Meganel would be much better, but we don't. So I think what we'll do here is we can slow the effectiveness of this guy if we wait until they... or if we wait to play a bronze, because they can only use this ability on a bronze card. So if we go, for example, with Doedric plus Snowdrop, then that could be a good way to set things up. So we'll do this first. He's actually... Oh, wait, what? Oh, yeah, he was... Oh, he was the one that got the, uh, the extra cultist tag, not Etibald. I might have said Etibald earlier. Okay, they'll go and turn Dodric into a spy. Which is, uh... I mean, did we... Did we earn our turn coat? We might have. I mean, our decks look really similar. So now what we can do is we could go Snowdrop, and this combo is very effective at, uh, well, just churning out a bunch of points and fine-tuning our hand further. Perhaps getting rid of Manganel, anything else that we really want to dump, mostly that. Eller could be a very nifty way to get rid of uh, Resilience and or other 
infusions they might add, because they likely will do that. So, I mean, we would also like to get our scenario happening as early as possible, but let's set up this combo. And we will do this. And there is the scenario. Okay, I like that a lot. Let's dump you guys, and let's just check what we get here. More purification, but I think we have... We have what we need for purification if we want to with the Peller. So because we drew into our scenario, we can now have a lot more flexibility with Onero. Okay, now they're going Deacon. That's probably what we'd like to do here to get more cultists happening as quickly as possible. And I mean, we'll do this to see what we get. We probably don't want that, but just by doing that, we get two more points on Snowdrop. So yes, let's go Deacon here. And turn as many people into cultists as we can. Now, this is going to put down a bronze unit, which means that they finally will be able to use their initiate. So that's why we did not do this right off the bat. And we also kind of like to target this initiate. See if we can create another one on our side. So who do we want to turn into cultists? I think probably Thirsty Dame would be really nice. I mean, Etibald on. That guy could be useful as well. But the more cultists we have, the more things get infused. When we trigger chapter one of our scenario, now here is that combo we were saying we were going to see. And they may throw out their scenario right now. Because they're a little ahead of us when it comes to the cultists. But, oh, yep. I was strongly considering using Duchess's performance in this deck. I just didn't think we'd see too many mirror matches like this. But they certainly got a lot of value out of that, getting more cultists. Let's do this. And turn more people into cultists. Again, technically speaking, bronzes are worth a little bit more because they will increase the value of the boost by one more point than the golds do. So we could even go Nero into another deacon. If we're feeling really greedy here, let's see what we get here. I was thinking about giving Emir the uh, cultist status, but I didn't. But we do this. Maximize the total cultist count, and we do probably want to get Etibald in round one, so I will still go and give him the, the cultist status, even if he is a gold and the uh, Peller is a bronze. So we could, of course, purify this infusion off of one of our cards. It would mean we lose the resilience, so that's why we like doing that. <laughs> that's why we're supposed to be the ones doing the infusions. Because it forces our opponents to make some tough decisions. Now, of course, the shoe is on the other foot here, so to speak. Okay, Mage Torturer. Who did they even... What? Get... Oh, to Dodrick? I swear, I just didn't see the spying status show up. It looked like they did it to no one. No, he already was a spy. And now we go scenario, and they might pass as soon as they see this, but honestly, it'll stay on the board, so that's fine. So we do this. Let us create some additional cultists in our deck. Again, technically, bronzes are nice, but, you know, might we want to Mata with our Nero in round two to make the round go longer? Perhaps. Perhaps. Still not a huge fan of you. We'll dump you. Do they have Heat Wave? No, they're just passing. So here's the thing. In Standard, absolutely. Makes sense. And in Trench, not only do we have a 10-point lead here, we have Resilience on our scenario. So this is going to stick around. So that's why this is still okay. Now we're going to lose this specific Initiate, the one that we spawned in, but so be it. We still have the one in hand. And because we kept Snowdrop on the board in between rounds, she actually starts off getting boost from the cards we drew into right here. So that's pretty amazing. And we drew into the Initiate. That's great. We drew into Mata as well. That's also great. Heller we could use to purify the Eclipse. Now that we no longer have Resilience on it, it's not as much of a downside. So that is an option. We're probably going for the 2-0 here, in which case, you know, that does mean that the removing our opponent's resilience is perhaps a little less meaningful. So getting a Thirsty Dame, which is a more powerful engine and one that we gave the Cultist status to, I think is probably preferable. So 
I think we probably do want to trigger Chapter 1 here as quickly as possible because we have done all of our cultist setup in Round 1 by playing both of our Deacons. So I like that, and that means we'd like to go probably Etibald as early as possible to set up the damage there, and in doing so, I uh, target you, and then next turn maybe use the Initiate and make this be the recipient of this infusion, and that way we can get another Initiate, and maybe, you know, that the process continues, and that'd be great. So I think that's the plan. There's the infusion on our side that turns everyone into uh, an engine. Everyone who has the cultist tag. Do this. Ooh, you are a cultist. But then again, everyone is a cultist. So it's technically not all that necessary that we play you when Mata has a little more value because she helps us draw into other cards. They're going to try to take out Doedric. And there's their scenario. Maybe they didn't have it in round one. That's why they kept it short. Gives us another target to go after, though. So, now I think we do go with our initiate here. So, he wants to target you. Okay, now it's hard to turn Vincent down. He is our more powerful cultist, the one that receives the Master of Ceremonies uh, infusion. So, he deals three damage, which would be enough to destroy you. And... That's regardless of how he also can destroy a card that has a status, which could be almost anything. So that's really good, and that's really hard to turn down. Uh, <laughs> I want to keep him. I mean, we could just use him as the Avenir target, I suppose. Maybe we dump Mata. And we can go Avenir into Mata if we really want to. So they're going to do that. Yeah, that's... I mean, basically, it is a carbon copy of what we're going for here. Yenvo! Oh no, wait. They did for Etibald? Okay, we did still get the infusion on you, but of course, if we were able to chain more of those together, that would have been even better still. But so now the idea is we go and do this. Which means that we could... If we played Vincent, we immediately destroy you. From the damage alone, not even from the using his ability, which means there's no one left to use his ability on. Which is a little unfortunate. So I think what we do here is we actually go with a this initiate. That'll give us boosts. That'll damage you a lot. So that's, again, why Vincent just isn't really necessary here. Do this just to see what we get. And in large part, it's just to boost up Snowdrop further. And technically speaking, if we go linear ability here, we would destroy you. But I think we have enough damage here. This will get boosted by one of their next turn, but between... The card we play, which will be a cultist, and this. You should get destroyed. No matter what. Okay, their Onero. Well, they still are Onero. A little lucky, of course, but what do they get with it? Oh, well, I mean, the anti ball they stole. It's like, did they have that or so? Well, I mean, they, obviously they took it with with uh, the Yenvo we just saw. Who? Oh, and created another one. Okay, this is a little scary. That's a lot of damage as well. Okay, we just need this one turn. This one turn. Because we can do... That. Okay. I think the plan is... Vincent. Well... Order of Operations. No, I think we... Leader Ability... Destroys you. Vincent. Will destroy you just from the damage? No, not quite. Ugh. It's a little awkward. Maybe we just go Thirsty Dame and that will destroy you. Boost up our guys. Spawn in one of these guys. Do this. I mean... Not totally against going with Peller. Getting rid of some of the infusions they've given to us. They should go after this guy. We're just going to trade off creating copies of an Eternal Eclipse Initiate, aren't we? I'm pretty sure we are. Mm -hmm. 
We may. Now this will destroy, uh, it's just that we ideally like to infuse one of them and be able to create a copy of it before we destroy it, but that's probably no longer possible. We also, technically speaking, if we are playing Prophet in this round, then we need to play him now. Otherwise, he's going to lock himself, and that's less than ideal. So I think we do that here. And that is actually our second gold cultist, which means we can get a few more cultists here. Though all the cultists, or all the cards in our hand are currently cultists. I think we'll keep you in the deck. And this is why the resilience on these cultists matters, is because this ability builds up in power over time. So like, this guy has resilience right now. And whenever we play Cultus, he's getting boosted by four. That will remain the case. He'll lose the boost in between rounds, but that infusion will stay. Okay, Vilgefortz is clever. Probably go after perhaps this guy. Oh, except he's getting locked. Oh, from the Prophet. Very well-timed Prophet at that. You love to see it. What is Onira going to give us? I mean, it could be Mata. She is a Cultist and might help us get additional Cultus. Or they will forfeit. Here, match successful, we'll take the win. All right, so going up against Syndicate here, and they'll go first. And good stuff, because we have our scenario in hand right off the bat, along with Oniro giving us some flexibility. One of the infused cultists, so gold cultists, and so that means we have enough gold cultists to trigger chapter one of this scenario right off the bat. In fact, more than enough, so that's great. Could even get more gold cards with Mata. In fact, we, if anything, arguably would like more of our bronze cultists, which are a little lacking right now. I'm, of course, not thrilled about swapping out one of our golds to make that happen, but was looking for one of the other cultists, and in all likelihood, well, we just made up not to play Peller. Then again, of course, purifying. A powerful card might not be a terrible idea, but we can still get a little bit of cultist action going just from what's built in directly to the scenario. So that's, of course, probably still reason enough for us to proceed here. Okay, Fallen Knight has Veil, which means it does not get the resilience and also cannot be hit with this infusion, whereas the tax collector can. So this is probably the direction we're going to opt to go is immediately target you. And then we can use one of our gold cultists to progress the scenario further. And it's probably going to be Emir. I mean, we, on one hand, I mean, we'd like to ideally get one more cultist down there first, I suppose. Oh, we can swap some things out using Doedric and see if we can maybe get some more bronze cultists and replace Peller. So... Suppose that means we'll go Prophet next, and then we'll do Emir after that. Or, no, we'll actually go Onero into Snowdrop. Oh, who happens to be okay, the other cultist? Did not get the chance to really see that, that was the case. So what I was looking to do was potentially, ooh, okay, like the cultist. I do like the cultist. I was hoping to get something like Eternal Eclipse Deacon earlier on so that we could uh, more rapidly and preemptively increase the number of cultists that we have so that we can get this whole whenever you play cultist boost up by one thing happening earlier. But alas, that was not the case. And Snowdrop is no longer a cultist, which is bad on a few in a few ways because that, of course, meant she would have gotten boosted up from us playing other cultists and would have eventually dealt three damage whenever we played our next cultist, but alas, that is not the case now because, well, we no longer have three cult, or we no longer already have two cultists on the board. So... I mean, we could still, of course, do this, and we probably will do this. Turn... Dodrick into a cultist, because I think we would like to play him very soon. So we can get this Snowdrop plus Dodra combo going, which is fantastic now. Of course, they purified Snowdrop, which also means she wanted the Resilience, which would have made this combo even better still. 
Yeah, they're boosting Tax Collector to try to prevent it from getting destroyed. But we have, uh, if we need to, a very quick way to get rid of it. But I'd rather not resort to that just yet. And with one, two cultists, three cultists that are playing Emir, that means we would get damage on you. So that is nice. Let's do this while we're at it. And this is the kind of thing where ideally you are preemptively getting more people to count as cultists. Before you start triggering the first chapter of this scenario. If we do this. We'll boost our guys and damage you and get this other cultist down. We can now make even more cultists. And technically at this point, bronze cultists are worth a little bit more than gold cultists are if we're choosing. Because this number goes up by two whenever we play a bronze cultist. It only goes up by one when we're playing a... A gold cultist, and that is why this deck is so effective in this event, because this infusion, I mean, it locks some of these cards, like Dodric. I mean, this combo was already less effective, because they purified Snowdrop as well, but because this infusion will stay in between rounds, and, uh, well, I mean, this card doesn't have resilience because we spawned it in, but, uh, what we really want in that case is to get more people like Emir down here, who have the, the added status. It has them get boosted when we play Cultus and power that component up. So let's do this. And we will put back the uncultistified version of that dude. Okay, and the thing is, their deck is built almost entirely, basically it is built entirely around spawning. They are, of course, Congregate. They'll get the Sunset Wanderers out here. But that's a summon, not a play, so that's no resilience on that. You don't have resilience, and the units that you spawn in don't have resilience either. So this is a bit of an odd choice for this event. Now, that should destroy the Tax Collector when we play the Imperial Enforcers. So I'm thinking we go that route, and of course it also gives us some more damage, especially when combined with Emir. So I think that does work quite well. We'd also like to get Antibald set up early as well, so I mean, that's something we should technically play. Probably now, to be honest. Probably now. Because this is capable of dealing two damage in one turn, so even if this does get boosted up by one, we're still going to be okay. So... Let's do this. I'm not necessarily sure we have a great target to be the recipient of this. Suppose you. Because you are also an engine. Not quite as powerful as Fallen Knight, but close to it. Given armor to the tax collector, well, as we were just saying. Yeah, it's either... It's gonna be... Give the, the damage... To this guy or potentially this guy this is the setup this is the guy who's going to eventually get boosted from it granted you were weaker so it's probably more feasible to target you but uh, we should still be able to take this guy out if we go with the enforcers here because that's one damage when we play it another damage when we use the order ability so there we go okay they're gonna destroy one of their cards, and I... Oh, is that a ball of night they got rid of to get Ulrich? I mean, usually you'd not make that big of a sacrifice. You'd destroy something like a Zealot to get another Fallen Knight. Not so this time, though. Okay, that does tell us they have a Cleric in their hand. Which will help them convert these guys to slightly stronger units than again. Still no resilience on these guys, because they got, they got spawned in. And so these two, or these three, really, are the most threatening here. And is that reason enough to try to destroy one of them all together with Vincent? Possibly. Although, of course, they played one more card than us, and they have not passed us. 
It's a little bit different in this event because, of course, you could continue to play cards and still gain more resilience. So it's not uh, it's not totally as if you're just throwing away cards to lose round one. But that is something we could consider doing is, is end this round here. But we do kind of like long rounds because if we can get more cultists, we can power up our infusions a little bit further. I think we go Mata. Make this round go a little bit longer and we get more cultists. And that's what we're looking for here. And at this point... I mean, if you were in removal range, that'd be great, but you aren't. It does complicate matters a bit. Because, again, you're the weakest of all the cards we'd like to go after. Or technically, you are, actually. So, yeah, I guess we're maybe looking to have this round go just long enough that we can remove you. Or the other one that you're going to create. And generally speaking, Congregate definitely likes a long round. So by making round one go longer, we are definitely making it tougher for them. Who did we hit with? We hit you with Etibald. So... I mean, that to another one of you guys. They'll lose armor in between rounds as well. So technically, if we're just planning for round two, then throwing this on the Eternal Fire Disciple might actually be preferable, even if it's not going to do much in this round. So what if we do this? We do this. Just to get even more cultists out here. And more boosts. And then we use this damage here. It's almost enough to destroy one of those guys, and we actually could swipe you now, so why not? Okay, now they'll pass. And so that means we've won round one. We, I think, have a considerably higher amount of resilience going on here, because a lot of their points are coming from units that either have the Veil. Maybe they did leave the Fallen Knight there. Perhaps that's the second one. I didn't, don't remember exactly, but... All these guys they spawned in that also don't have the resilience. We have one big card that doesn't have resilience. Two somewhat big cards that don't have resilience. And I think we'll still have more going into the next round. Alright, so ideally we're looking for more cultists here. We have one with the Prophet, of course. Didn't play him in round one because by the time we got around to him, he would have had his uh, Adrenaline 2 kick in and that's no good for us. Let's see if we can get Thirsty Dames or any of our... Really, any of our starting bronze cultists. They like that. That's good. And we still have Emir down here, so Manganil does work. And does work well at that. We would perhaps like to play Prophet early, however. See, so yeah, here we see we have almost double their points. And lock one of their cards while we still can. Trigger the boost on our cultists, at least a little bit. I would like to get you going early. And perhaps target you? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. We have one more turn before we need... Well, we will play you on the next turn, basically. Now, obviously, we're going for the 2-0 here. Okay, Cyrus is big. But... Is he big enough? I don't think he will be. Because when you do that conversion, I mean, certainly if you get a Fall Knight out here with Veil, that's not going to get the resilience. I don't even think anyone through Cyrus gets resilience. I might be misremembering that. But we can now do Etibald, and I mean, at this point, who would we like to go for here? Possibly Cyrus. Not sure we're going to have enough time to actually destroy him, but any other high-priority people... You already have this. I don't remember. You might be able to double down on it, but we could go. I guess we'll go with this cleric. You are close to getting destroyed. So let's do that. Honestly, it might have been a little bit overkill, but now we go profit. That will destroy you. And now we can spawn in the zealots, and we have a little bit of coinage. So we can actually get a little bit of value out of that. 
Might as well. We could convert it as well if we really wanted to, but... Uh, damage. Will eventually be on you. But I don't think we need to rush to that just yet. We'd actually like to get you down pretty early as well. Because with Emir, that just equals damage. Okay, Sacred Flame is a strong finisher. Yes. This guy is being difficult to remove. He does still have that status, which means we technically could use Vincent, and maybe that'll be our finisher, is just get rid of whatever their tallest card is with Vincent, and it'll almost certainly be you. What are we going to get with Oniru? Uh, we could get another Initiate, which, or a Thirsty Game, which would have liked to have gotten one of them earlier, probably. I mean, any Cultist will do at this point, I suppose, but... Yeah, I mean, either of those would be nice. I guess we'll do this. This is two cards, which means we go this route. We'll get a little bit of damage from that and from this. And then we can go and destroy you with this damage. And then I suppose that means we'll... Uh, Technically, this is worth more points. We're getting a little crowded here in our rows, but... That is one more point than this is, right? Okay, Helvede. Another strong card, but it's getting locked for the profit. So they did not want to have to do that. And now, I guess it's making L, and as we said, we'll finish with Vincent. So let's do, well, first. I mean, whatever we do this to, even if we do destroy it, we're probably not going to have space for it. We have the most room in our melee row. I guess we'll do this. Oh, uh, well, except we're probably going to destroy you with, with Vincent anyway. Technically, you're a little bit bigger, but we can't mark you. So that obviously doesn't work. So, I mean, this is obviously the easiest target to destroy. But as I said, we actually don't really want to do that. Otherwise, we're going to run out of space. So we'll do this first. All right, Profit... And now, I mean, for good measure, I suppose, why not? And I don't know. Give it to really anybody. It's just going to be one damage. I don't like it. Won't even have room for a leader, really. But use Vincent. Get rid of him. I mean, technically, you're the biggest card. I suppose we choose you. And while we're at it, let's just... Get rid of you altogether, because you were an engine. No room for our leader building, but you know, with a 62-point lead, I think we'll be okay. Even if their finisher is Jacques. Can't use Hemelfart when your row is full anyway. We'll get the boost from the Sacred Flame. But even with that, we'll still hold on for the win. So there's a look at a Nilfgaard Cultist deck for the new Entrenched Seasonal Events. If you liked the video, then make sure to hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment down below to let me know which other cards, archetypes, and factions you'd like us to experiment with next. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you next time.